I'm going to try to address an astounding problem, and I'm going to make an assumption in this that nine billion uh, is not something we have much control over, that uh, the, the trends of uh, demographics are already there, and we need to figure out how to work with those trends. My reference point personally to the issue of food uh, is growing up in the country, having a green thumb, being the kid who was responsible for the family vegetable garden, uh, working on farms and then working with farmers in India to help them figure out how to have a better livelihood, but I'm not an agricultural economist or an agronomist or anything like that. I mostly just want to wrestle with this problem, which is a very uh, compelling one. The other thing is that I have no credentials in terms of being a designer, and I think maybe I understand something about design, but I'm probably going to come at it from an angle that is not um, uh, conventional within the design profession. So what I want to do is put the way I approach this difficult problem uh, in the context of where I've come from with my work. Um, then I'm going to um, uh, speculate and explore the problem a bit, um, reference that to some things happening in the real world to sort of give a sense whether the speculations are, are accurate, and then uh, sum it up with some questions about design, which I hope you designers uh, here or those of you who are in the f design fields um, will uh, entertain with me as we have discussions. Um, so what's my reference point? Um, what I've always done over the last uh, 20, 25 years is looked at huge problems and figured out how with the resources available to me, um, we could create systems for tackling them at big scale. And so, for instance, um, in a wacky way, in the late 1980s, uh, had the notion that we ought to get cities around the world to be the leaders in tackling the problem of global climate change, which is a pretty funky thing uh, in the early, late 1980s. Uh, cities were still back then understood as places that dealt with sidewalks and water supply and collected your trash, and climate change wasn't even an accepted problem. So um, created uh, a set of methods, a set of tools, um, a whole programmatic framework, scaled it up. Uh, this program uh, has now involved more than 800 cities in 50 countries. Um, and in effect, I would argue, um, made cities around the world not only leaders in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, but actually the political leaders speaking to it in, in forums like Copenhagen. Um, in a very different way, um, working with uh, BP, British Petroleum, to figure out how we could eliminate smoke from uh, the homes of, uh, in particular, uh, rural women uh, in their cooking rooms um, throughout southern India. Uh, developing with uh, a BP team a smokeless biomass stove and a new fuel, a biomass pellet made from agricultural waste um, that they use with that fuel. And so doing all of the eth ethnographic research, the qualitative research, um, working with industrial designers and engineers to design this stove that, as you see here in prototype form, um, burns biomass with a kind of a natural gas-like flame, almost a blue flame, um, then figuring out how one could create a very low-cost channel for distributing and, and selling the stove um, throughout rural India, where there's a lot of distance to cover. Um, so engaging uh, microcredit networks, women's self-help groups, to um, evolve them from uh, micro, you know, get some microcredit and get a goat, you know, and make a little money with your goat's milk or your cow, um, to becoming small business leaders within their villages, um, training them to meet the standards of a company like BP, don't laugh, please, for health and safety. Um, and they, they, I don't, you know, how it breaks down uh, is a whole other discussion, but anyway. Here you see a woman who was, uh, you know, is a villager um, in a somewhat tacky way, wearing the BP colors, but um, working with a group of other women to create a new retail force uh, in India. So moving from design as industrial design to design uh, of a business model and a business system, um, ultimately scaling this up so that not only did BP succeed in eliminating smoke from the huts of about 2,000, 2 million, sorry, families so far, but um, 
created a whole model of retailing and distribution in India that now has the same women selling Godridge refrigerators and nutritional products. And so these women are becoming retailers and you know, all of the impacts that come with that in terms of women having uh, power in the household, more resources, uh, more respect. Uh, another example in India, uh, working with Thomson Reuters to figure out how we can get the middlemen out of the way for small farmers. So how do you use the mobile phone as a platform um, for getting them information about not only what are the prices in the markets um, uh, in their districts, but also what are the price trends so that they can figure out when to bring their food to market, doubling their household income, but also giving them um, localized weather information and extension information, all for about a dollar a season, uh, off of which they double their income each crop cycle. Um, and then finally, um, and I think you know, relevant to where I want to go with this big problem, uh, in 1992, in the context of the Earth Summit um, that took place in Rio de Janeiro, starting a program called Local Agenda 21, the purpose of which was, how does one engage communities and the citizenry broadly and thinking about how sustainable development, it was then a very new agenda, um, gets resonance and is contextualized locally. So how do people locally make something out of this thing about how we deal with economy and environment and social development all together? And uh, this program called Local Agenda 21, the UN reports, by 2000 uh, had engaged more than 10,000 communities in 115 countries. Um, and developing sustainable development sort of strategies. And you see here listed a number of the kinds of things that came out of that. So um, we've been talking about doing small things. So um, easily hundreds of thousands of projects of the nature described here coming out of this program. And I end with that as an example. So where I'm coming from in terms of um, design as a product or a service then designing a business system and then designing a kind of a, a way to scale it up, whether it's a program or uh, a way to uh, transfer a business model from country to country. Um, by saying that at the end of this uh, eight year period of doing this kind of work, um, I had to do a stock taking and evaluate whether something of this scale um, with so many practical things um, was really having impact in terms of the challenges that we really do confront. And in a look in the mirror moment, had to um, come to the conclusion that it really wasn't. It, it was setting the stage for impact, but it wasn't really impacting the trends that we're trying to address. So I, I bring that perspective to it when I look at how we address the issue of 9 billion people being fed on the planet. I think something um, hugely ambitious needs to be pursue, pursued from a broadly defined design perspective if we're really seriously going to entertain uh, the ability to uh, solve the problem. Now, it would be easy, and if you go to the tables in the bookstores now, it would be easy to say the obvious, which is we're fucked, right? In the next 20 or 30 years, it's all a crumbling mess, and we can entertain ourselves by doing nice projects, right? Um, but for me, it's much more interesting, at least, to look at it from this point of view. This is my current project um, that I'm undertaking. And this is the title um, of the work in progress. And it's my proposition in terms of this issue, um, that the only way to um, genuinely deal with our anxiety and our grief and our aspiration to solve the problem is to look at it hugely. Right? And I think this has ramifications for what design needs to become in the future. That will be the, the, the closing point. Um, but how do we um, create a, a world in which 9 billion people can thrive and deal with the ultimate problem, which I would define in this way? That we've got one system that is incredibly complex and incredibly scaled. Um, that inhabits the same space with another system that is incredibly complex and incredibly scaled, and that these two systems fundamentally are designed uh, to undermine uh, each other. In particular, the one on the right um, that is growing faster than the natural systems that it is designed to extract from. So, what is happening in the planet is an urban system, I call it the city system with a capital C, 
um, is growing uh, at a tremendous rate, and it is designed to be an extractive system. Um, everything about our cities is to, built on the premise that uh, the food, the resources, you know, it's all, all the productivity happens uh, in the system on the left, and all the extraction happens in the system on the right. And when one system extraction goes faster than reproduction of those services, then obviously we hit the wall. Um, and the system isn't this is something different than the city as we understand it. So we still tend to think of cities as, uh, in conventional terms, as somehow a geographically contained uh, organization. It can even be governed by a jurisdiction, by a government. So we think we have a leverage over that through planning um, or through you know infrastructure resource allocation. I think if, and this is what I write about in the earlier book, Welcome to the Urban Revolution, if we consider this image um, uh, fully, what we have to understand is, is this is a globalized system. Um, districts in this city, a district in this city, has more interactivity and information and resource flows with a district in another city on the other side of the planet than households in this city um, have a relationship with the local district or with their city government. So in terms of financial flows, in terms of flows of energy, in terms of flows of people, in terms of flows of criminal activity, in terms of flows of species around the world, this is an integrated system. And if we're going to deal with the problem of the city uh, and its impacts on natural systems and on our food productivity, then we have to deal with it at the scale of this scaling thing. So we're still uh, in the middle of the growth of the system really, you know, it started in Europe m many centuries ago. But in terms of at a global scale, the middle of the last century to the middle of this century, so we'll hit um, uh, two thirds of the world's population, 6.7, 6.5 billion people in the system by uh, the middle of this century. Um, and so we have a little window in which to think about system redesign. And that's the starting point for thinking about um, how we deal with feeding 9 billion people. Um, some more facts to sort of frame out the nature of the challenge. So when people, the good news is that when people move to cities, um, fertility rates go down. Um, women uh, have more economic opportunity. Uh, they uh, have more chance to be educated. They um, make more choices in terms of reallocating family budgets. So, um, are, you know, around the world, fertility rates go down as countries populate, uh, urbanize, sorry. Um, and um, uh, that's balanced off with declines in mortality as well. So we have sort of a good and a bad. But the challenging thing on the food front is when people increase their incomes um, and move to cities and get into that kind of modern urban life, um, their consumption of protein goes up very dramatically. So these numbers are from China um, and, uh, and the increase in fish and meat protein between uh, Chinese uh, households in 1981 and urban Chinese households in 2004. So it's a huge problem. How do we increase uh, protein production, not just crop production? So Green Revolution helped us think about uh, uh, crop production and we're hitting the wall on that one. We also have a protein challenge now. There we go. Um, recent scientific report studied 100 fish species. Conclusion is fish are gone in 40 years. So, you know, we don't have to take that as a given, but we have to understand when we talk about 9 billion people, we may not have fish stocks to, sol to satisfy that protein need. I have a little problem in my slide thing here. Whoops, here we go. Um, one of the less discussed things of global climate change uh, is that CO2 acidifies the oceans. Um, and by acidifying the oceans, it um, eliminates the ability of small organisms that grow on the basis of calcium to create coral reefs. Um, so you see in the maps on the left, in the middle uh, section, you see about where we are now. So the, the blue, if you can make that out, is where the coral reefs are. Um, where it turns uh, white or red, there's um, too much acidification in the ocean to support coral reefs. So we can expect 
um, by the middle of this century that there won't be living coral reefs any longer, assuming that climate change scenarios continue. I know this is a bummer. I'm going to get to the good side. Um, even the small family farm, um, which we now see as kind of a pastoral ideal, um, is an amazing extractive machine. So this doesn't look like these big agro farms or the big Cargill type operations. This is what we sort of idealize as good country living. Seven times more energy input than the energy output that it creates in versus of food. So a massive extractive um, uh, system of, of growing food. So you see uh, the demands of agriculture on water supplies, and there's all kinds of issues of water scarcity, um, and then all kinds of issues in terms of soil degradation. So this is the context in which I come to the conclusion that the only way we sort of get through this phase and with 9 billion people, um, here's, here's a, actually, here's the latest before I get to that. Um, so now it's seen as agricultural system is seen as a security threat, right? It's so centralized and the supply chain is so vulnerable to attack that um, even from a security point of view, people are saying we have to rethink the food system. So I think the only way to do this in the proposition of this um, current project called the Thrive on Earth project is that as the city grows, as we fill it in and as we renew it, we have to transform it to an entirely different system. It has to become a productive system. Uh, it has to produce its own energy. It has to produce its own nutrients. And it has to produce the materials that it needs to build itself and to manufacture things within it. We have to figure out um, how this global city system actually withdraws from its extractive relationship with nature and becomes the center of production, not just in Brisbane as one city, but across the urbanized land area, the city system, as they call it, how it becomes the next biome on the planet, like the seas, like the forests, like the steppes. Um, uh, systems that produce their own nutrients, their own energy, their own resources, and replenish them. And without that meeting that challenge, uh, I would argue uh, we are entertaining ourselves with feel-good activities. So with that context, let's look at um, what we can do to design, to take a system that's been designed for extraction and redesign it for productivity. Here's your, here's your home territory. You know, gives it an impression it's not, you know, this is a messy, chaotic, complex thing. Even as it is, we don't feel we can control it. What can we do about it? So a system's a group of components that work together as a whole. So we're going to look at some of the key components because there are very different design challenges. And um, for the sake of focusing effort, I would argue there's four territories um, of design challenge. Some of them quite obvious, like technology. So designers are all over that, and we'll talk a little bit about technology. Um, space and structure, we talked a lot about that in uh, CJ's workshop today. How do we restructure space in order to solve big problems? Um, less talked about in the context of the design world is institutions, maybe a bit more business models, but perhaps the biggest design challenge is how we create an institutional space that can do this transformation. And then ultimately, how do we design culture? How do we design a culture that allows us to be producers as opposed to, um, to extractors? And ultimately, what we're trying to design here is within city spaces, agricultural, well, let me, I call it nutrient systems that will serve uh, a huge percentage of the nutrient demand within the cities. Not necessarily all of it. We don't have to stop farming um, in, in nature, um, but certainly we have to produce a significant portion of it. And how do, so how do we do that? Let's start with um, space and structure and understand where the challenges are and the opportunities are in terms of urbanization for designing space and structure to make cities places that produce their own food. There we go. Um, there's a project called the CLEAR Project um, based out of the University of Connecticut uh, where uh, a bunch of geographers studied satellite photography for 4,000 cities over a 30-year period of time. 
to try to understand spatially how the, earth, how the city system is growing. And the conclusion is, is that over the last 40 years, um, cities have grown seven times more on their periphery than they have uh, on the infill. So a lot of um, the challenge we start with here is the, the momentum of the way our cities grow, that we are consuming massive amounts of land, and uh, that is uh, important agricultural land, it's important mangroves and fish growing areas. So that's part of our spatial challenge. And I'm gonna, for the engineers in the room, throw up some numbers, I'll walk through this um, to try to frame out what this consumption of land issue is. So um, the World Health Organization says that a good diet requires about half a hectare per person. And the question that is posed here in this chart is, um, how much more land do we need or not need if we organize ourselves into a rural settlement pattern or an urban settlement pattern. So there's going to be um, 1.35 billion new urban uh, dwellers uh, by 2030. And what this does is somewhat back of the envelope says, well, how much land do we have to consume to settle them and feed them in a rural settlement pattern? Is that the way out, not build cities? and in cities. And you'll see on the far right here um, that for a rural settlement pattern, because the half a hectare that the people inhabit um, is also the place where they grow their food, that um, they, you know, and, and the numbers here look at uh, India and China. I should say that most of that 1.3 billion people are urban, new urban dwellers between now and 2030 are going to be in India and China. 485 million in India and about 400 million in, in China by 2030, 2040. So we'll look at India and China and um, the, the settlement, the, rural, the densities of rural living there. If we look at the densities of rural living in India and China, we'll need about six and a half to 6.7 million kilometers square of new area to settle this 1.3 billion people in a rural pattern. So how does that compare with when we settle them in an in urban pattern? What we're doing now is the scenario here called lower density uh, urban. So that's the current trend where there's seven times more growth on the periphery than on the inside. And you see in that scenario, if we keep growing our cities that way, we're going to need a significant amount more land um, to settle and feed people within cities. So to give them a place to live in a city and then give them their half a hectare outside of the city to grow their food. Right? So Having that kind of urban growth relative to a rural settlement scenario is dangerous. But as, as we move to the um, incredibly unbearable cities of San Francisco and Paris and the densities that they exist at, you know, and I know that in Australia uh, there's a problem with density. People don't care for it very much. So I use Paris as a terrible example of a high-density uh, city. As we move along the scale from San Francisco to Paris and their uh, 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 kinds of density you can see, at a certain level of density, um, the urban settlement, it's a wash between whether we settle people uh, rural or urban, right? So as density increases in cities, um, we actually can begin to see that spatially um, it becomes a wash whether they move to the city or not. And actually, I would argue as density increases, we can actually find a solution to having enough land to both settle them and feed them. So let's take a more simple way of looking at it. 10,000 square feet, 100 feet by 100 feet. Um, to feed these people, we need 53,000 square feet. So uh, if you have a family on this plot of land, which is kind of an average plot in the suburban area, you can see that we need a massive amount more land than where they live in order to feed them. And typically in a city, what we do is we pave over that land so they don't grow any food on it anyway. Um, and then we have divided up and have many more people on it. So here for the uh, 20 uh, individuals that would live on this 100 by 100 square feet, we need a million square feet of land. So we've got a bit of a problem here as these people move to the city in this low density solution. So let's add some density. Um, let's give them a place to grow some vegetables, which is a lot of what the discussions about urban agricultural are about today, isn't it? Um, people live dense, and then we've got some land in the city, and they can have garden plots. So you see these numbers don't add up whatsoever. I didn't even calculate out 
um, how many people would be living in these buildings, how many square kilometers of land we need in addition to the 2,500 square feet in order to have the slightest dent in their food supply. So this doesn't give us an answer whatsoever. But if we think of this vertical development of the city in a somewhat different way, and not one that's uh, that unfamiliar to you, and we think of the growth, the vertical growth of city as actually the production of arable land space, we can begin to see a way, spatial way, design-wise, um, out of the problem. So it's not just that we make our buildings attractive and green and more livable by growing vines on them, but we dedicate floors in these buildings for actual agricultural activity. So let's take a look at how that plays its way out. So green roofs is now the passe thing. Um, I think if we don't already, um, in a matter of uh, a few years, we'll sort of see that as sort of the first playfulness with the idea that what city building is actually all about in this period where we're moving from extractive system to productive system, what it really is all about is creating the land that we don't have. And that the design challenge is figuring out how to build arable land in our cities. And it starts with creating surface area, just building vertically, and then it goes to the next level of, oh, we could plant on it, and then it graduates to the next level of, can we now build buildings that are mixed residential office agricultural buildings? Um, and as you can see, there's all kinds of experimentation going on in this place, and I'm sure a number of you here are quite familiar with these. I'm going to talk a little bit about Vancouver. This is a design of a recent design for a building in Vancouver in which office, residential, and agricultural production are to take place all together. Um, some of the designs are kind of silly, but the concept is, is basically there. Um, we're going to look at some examples later of where there were actually approved plans to build this um, high-rise agricultural systems. But this spatial design issue, to boil it down, and it's sort of a no-brainer, but oddly we don't think about it, is, is that we, as we build cities, we need to think about um, what we're doing is increasing the volume of land on the earth because we know in nature um, there isn't going to be more land created. Only we can create more land for more people who need more land. So one of the projects um, uh, designed is for New York City. If you think of a 10-story uh, high-rise farm in New York City, it, it occupies a tenth of a New York City block. So the footprint on the ground is half uh, of an acre. Sorry, I'm switching between metric and um, uh, the British system but we'll just sort of abide by it. Everything is relative. So what you do is by creating a 10-story building dedicated to ag agriculture is you create five acres of arable surface on the planet that wasn't there before. And because it's enclosed and you have um, a, a climate-managed system within that, you get, say, three harvests a year. So the actual effect of this design experiment is that you actually end up with 15 more nutrient acres than you had if you left that as a rural land, right? Um, which is the equivalent of a 30-fold increase in productive area through this kind of building. So that's one part of the solution, which is we have to be in the business of building uh, productive land within our cities. The frontier of this now is to get even more fractal, right? So to take the space within it and divide it up into many, many, many more surface areas, and then to grow in that. And this is an example of a company that is in the business of fractalizing the spaces within buildings. I'll talk a little bit about their technology, but one can only begin to calculate if you take this high-rise farm and you put that much more layering within it, how much more arable land you're producing on the earth. And that's not too dissimilar to what these systems did, right? Um, not only created verticality, but created so much surface area that they can support many um, species, many productive activities um, living together in a symbiotic way. So in effect, high-rise agriculture is nothing but us mimicking nature in that regard. Many species living together in a way that they somehow provide nutrients to one another, and that's what the concept of high-rise agriculture is all about. 